Welcome everyone, bienvenides. My name is Pato Hebert and I have the privilege of serving as chair of the Department of Art and Public Policy here at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. This spring, the Department of Art and Public Policy is partnering with NYU Skirball, the 370J Project and Tisch's Institute of Performing Arts to present a series of programs. And that series is called Art and Its Publics, Tonight's event, which is entitled Setting the Stage for What's Next, The Future of American Theater, is the second program in our series. And as soon as tomorrow night, March 31st at 8.30 p.m. EST, we have another program called Mutual Aid and Collective Formations, which is a roundtable discussion with four community organizers from around the country. It's organized with the One Archives Foundation in Los Angeles, and I'll drop that program information into the chat in a little while. Um, before we get started with tonight's exciting program, I did want to give a special thanks to Kristen Kalaki and Emily Brown of the Department of Art and Public Policy. The pandemic may still require us, unfortunately, to be together on Zoom, but it can't keep us apart. Thank you to them and our partners, um, including Jay Wegman at NYU Skirball, Ellen Toscano at the 370J Project, and again, our colleagues at the Tisch's Institute of Performing Arts. I wanna let folks know that we are recording tonight, so it'll be available should you want to return to it or share it with your people in your networks. And we are also having live captioning so that it's accessible. I have to say, um, I'm really quite honored to be colleagues with the luminary Anna Devere Smith, who's a renowned actress and playwright and teacher who has created a new form of theater. She will lead tonight's discussion along with three artistic directors from around the country whose bold and visionary leadership is really shaping the future of theater in this country. And I'm quite excited and thrilled to be with all of them. Um, in addition to Anna, it's my great pleasure to welcome Nataki Garrett of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Hannah Sharif of the Repertory Theater of St. Louis, and Eric Ting of the California Shakespeare Theater for what promises to be a vibrant conversation. Now, I have to say, I could spend our entire allotment of time giving you the extensive and dynamic bios of each of our panelists. Instead, I'll drop the more lengthy bios into the chat. Didn't want them to feel shortchanged, nor you as audience. Um, but we are so excited um, to be with everyone, and we want to maximize conversation time. This powerhouse lineup is going to speak for about 40 minutes, um, and then we'll field questions from you via the Q&A function that you can see kind of in the bottom right corner of your window at the bottom there. It looks like two comic balloon chat windows. And um, we are in a webinar format, so the chat is turned off, but we definitely want to encourage you to drop your questions into that Q&A function as you're listening to this rich conversation that's about to kick off. Please feel free. Um, to do so throughout the discussion and then when we open formally for Q&A. Um, I have to say that we are in a webinar mode here, of course, so we're not sitting together in NYU Skirball Center. But if we were, I would ask all of you in the audience to put your hands together and warm up the space to excite our panelists and welcome them to the conversation. We're very fortunate to be with each of you tonight. And Professor Anna Devere Smith, welcome. I was muted. I saw it. I caught it without people screaming, you're muted, you're muted. Uh, <laughs> Pato, thank you for collaborating with me on this. It's really you reached out about it. And I, I love that when that happens at a place as big as NYU. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you to Jay and Ellen. And thank you, of course, to the panelists. You know, uh, panel discussions, believe it or not, did not always exist. It was something that came about through experimentation by a psychologist sometime in the 20th century. And I say that just to say that, you know, I, I think that the, when we get to questions and discussion, I really hope that people will step forward. Uh, all of the three individuals we have here are trying to um, get rid of some old stuff and start some new stuff. I personally have trying to get rid of um, passive spectatorship. So really take advantage of our time <laughs> of being together uh, to make this 
um, something vibrant in terms of this very important and transformational moment that we are in, that we are on the edge of. I'm going to start with you, Eric, because we've actually worked together. Um, what are you? Uh, what are you leaving behind, and what are you moving forward as uh, artistic director of Cal Shakes? Um, say something about your theater and congratulations, because when I knew you, you were uh, an associate and you weren't running the thing. A struggling director. <laughs> uh, thanks, Anna. Um, thanks, Pato. Thanks, everyone. Good to be here um, in uh, really illustrious company. Um, friends, all of you. Uh, I would say, you know, so I'm the artistic director of California Shakespeare Theater, which is um, a Shakespeare theater going, it's about 47, 47 years old right now. Um, it's based in the Bay Area. It's a sort of outdoor amphitheater nestled in the Arinda Hills. Um, and we do a mix of classic work. And one of the things that I think we've been centering our work around has been this notion of really resisting assumptions around what classical is and what classic is, um, and trying to put forth alternative, an alternative vision um, for what we center and how we center it. Um, I would say that's a great question. And um, I'm going to say that I think I'm going to leave behind, I'm going to leave behind all my assumptions. That's what I want to, like, I'm going to leave behind all my assumptions. And I think that's been a thing that um, uh, I've been really trying to practice for this past year um, to really kind of um, like everything, like even the things that I, even the things that I often sort of shield myself with. Uh, that's, that's my desire to leave all of that behind. And as far as what I'm um, taking forward, um, I guess I would say short answer, humility, uh, a practice of deep listening, um, and um, a desire to level uh, the playing field. Cool. Hannah, what, what, about, what about you? What are you moving forward and what are you leaving behind? Yeah, no, it's such an interesting question. I, I think um, I am leaving behind the notion that I cannot bring the whole of myself to the work uh, and that I cannot recognize the whole of my humanity. Um, I feel really joyful to be in the company of uh, these dear friends and colleagues who are also all parents. Uh, we all have daughters. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, Natake and I have infants, <laughs> both born in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, it was revolutionizing for me to understand what it means to hold the duality of um, leadership in crisis and to be able to recognize the fundamental thing that makes us human. Uh, through the experience of the birth of my daughter. And so I leave behind the sense that I have to segment myself to do this work. And I move forward with the belief that the best of our industry is yet to come. And that this moment of crisis is a rebirth and a rebirth that will allow for the possibility to move the culture forward. And so uh, while others see the challenges and the glass half uh, uh, empty, I think we are, we are on the, the cusp of great abundance. Mm -hmm. And Itaki, what about you? Um, I, <laughs> I'm also uh, grateful to be here and um, thankful to be in conversation with you once again. Um, and I, um, I've been thinking through my colleagues. I, I think I'm leaving behind the notion that um, change um, should be easy and amenable in order for it to be possible. That I um, that I no longer vibe with anybody who tells me that uh, that change is impossible because it's hard or because we don't know how. Um, I'm leaving all of those notions of um, that the, those, those arbitrary and unreal obstacles to to committing to change. I'm leaving that behind, and then I, I'm moving forward to. I, I believe that my organization is a container for the future. It is an 85-year-old organization. I, I believe that 2020 is the end of the last 85 years, and 2021 is the beginning of the next 85 years and that I'm moving forward to future building 
not in rhetoric, not in ideology, but in actual action. How do I create this container for the future of my organization? And how do I affect the container for the future for my field that I love so dearly? Um, well, one of the things I think that would be interesting to the extent that you are aware of it, just say a little bit about the missions of your organizations when they started. Right, because one of the things I always, I always tell, told my students when the pandemic started with, was there was not always off-Broadway, there was not always not nonprofit theater as we know it, and there was not always regional theater. And I like to quote, I like to credit, of course, our own, the late Zelda Fitchhandler, who really was a mover and shaker. So I bring that up to them because I want them to think about, you know, just doing something new. But having said that, uh, Hannah, maybe we could start with you about um, Repertory Theater of St. Louis. Um, what, how did they, what, when did they start it? Why did they start it? And what were they, what did they state that they were trying to do? Well, it's really interesting. We are in our 54th season and we are on the campus of Webster University where the theater has been since its inception, um, which uh, originally was a Catholic university. And so the, the theater was actually created by the nuns uh, and uh, a community that wanted to um, have an avenue for storytelling. There was a, a passion for the concept of plays and it really did start as a local space for storytelling in a community that had no space for that type of storytelling. And from the earliest days, there was the birth of the professional theater. And there was also birth alongside it, a thing called the Imaginary Theater Company, which was an experimental space that has evolved through the course of the last 50 years. It's now a touring children's theater company. But when it was created, the Imaginary Theater space was a space for experimental theater. Um, there wasn't a clearly stated mission in the very beginning, but the mission statement that has been carried through for the last 40 or so years is one that we are actually in the process of deep um, reassessment and evaluation on because it is simply a space for eclectic theater. That's what the mission is that the company has held. And so, you know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about this moment that we're all in is that we've all inherited organizations with missions, but missions are really processed and executed through the vision of the leadership. And uh, sometimes the, the vision and the vision statement is clearly articulated and sometimes you only discover it through the act and the work. Um, and I think that this is a really critical moment for the field and for those of us in particular who are stepping into these leadership positions as part of this next generation, for us to take the time to be really clear and evaluative about the why we do this work and how we will manifest those missions through our visions and who our vision is working in service of. And so those are the kinds of questions that I spend a lot of time tossing and turning, not just in my own mind, but also calling my colleagues, including those on the screen, to debate about. What about Cal Shakes, Eric? You know, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> I inherited an organization, so I don't actually know that I know in my bones what the mission statement was when this organization was founded. Um, but thinking a little bit about your question, I'm remembering um, uh, a, a moment that I had when I was at Longmore Theater and I was sort of, we were, we were in the middle of the strategic planning process and we were looking at, I was like, my job was to research mission statements across the theater in this country. And there was like, there was like a pretty large bucket of mission statements that all basically sounded exactly the same, which was to produce excellent professional theater of a certain quality and to deliver that to its community um, and that that was kind of the purpose and the goal. And I think, um, I think for us, as we've been, I, mean, I, I think what Hannah says about the mission statement being really um, a kind of uh, litmus for where we are in the moment is I think such a real thing. Like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like this notion of a mission statement that is sort of um, permanent. There's, not, there's nothing permanent about that idea. And I think for us, what we've been trying to do is really to think about um, just to shift, like again, to shift 
this idea, right, of, uh, you know, the, the historic point of view of art for art's sake, right, of the value of culture, um, uh, the value of art as, um, as a kind of creation, as, a, as an offering to a community. Um, and I just find that right now that, that idea feels insufficient to me. Um, it feels, it feels just, it feels um, sometimes for me personally, very empty. Um, and so more and more, uh, we're trying to think about art for our sake. How does art, how is art actually a tool, right? For, um, to create more resilient communities. Mm -hmm. And Nataki, how about you? So um, 85 years ago in the middle of the Great Depression, Angus Bomer started the Oregon Shakespeare Festival um, as a Shakespearean festival in Lithia Park, uh, where people could come and bring their families and picnic. And because he wasn't sure if the experiment would, would work, the early days um, aligned um, you could you could see a Shakespeare play, and then also there would be a boxing match later on that night. Um, and so uh, the early mission of the of this organization, you could see, a, they, boxing you could see a, a boxing match. Yeah, so it was like two you for could one. Bring that basically. back, girl. That's, that's yeah, you know what I mean, because it, it would bring them back, right? So, but you know, part of the the what that teaches me about these early early days of this um, experiment that we're still in the middle of, eighty five years later, is. Um, that when you when when the when the mission is to sort of deliver on the product of of a, a single voice, and then you're not sure if that single voice is is going to be welcomed or consumed or even you know people aren't going to like it, um, um, uh, and then you offer something else as a kind of augmentation. It's like early days of repertory, right? Where um, where you, these two things would run in alignment with each other, those two converging stories coming together in alignment with each other. Um, you know, and since there have been so many versions of the mission, we're we're going to go through a strategic plan, which I'm sure will will come to, on the other side with a new set of mission and a vision and a vision and values. Um, but the early days was this um, this teacher at the local college who wanted to start something and did and um, and really liked. Uh, he was really excited by this idea of like the amateur and how the amateur takes on this work and, and, and not about, you know, everybody can access it because it was very clearly, he said it in the middle of Oregon, which is a sundown, was a sundown state at the time in what is like Southern Oregon, which is, you know, sundown territory. So um, there was a kind of idea of exclusivity, but this experiment with people who didn't know how to perform Shakespeare at this time when he didn't know if people could, could, could consume it, giving something very kind of regular and per popular culture you know to the populace um this convergence of of uh, repertory between this something aggressive and something else aggressive is i think is sort of culminates this early mission i don't believe os had had a mission os have had a mission for another 20 years i don't think that it even you know i don't, I don't even think they were thinking about mission they were like we're just going to do action you know and see what happens this it's still an experiment yeah very interesting I just think of Ashland, you know, uh, as this place that kind of, you know, people walking around, this was in the seventies, you know, wispy clothes in the woods and, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here you all are. Um, well, okay. So, you know, look, the, the, a big event for all of us, and we're revisiting it now, aren't we, uh, was the murder of George Floyd. And I know Hannah and Nataki that you and I were in a, <clears throat> conference environment after that with many theaters. I won't say what, because I can't remember how much that was in confidence. And Eric, you may have been there. Um, I, were you there? Yeah. So talk to me about, from this particularly perspective of your generation, you know, being in um, a environment with many theater leaders that you've known before, almost entirely white, What's your sense of what the reckoning is going to do and what it is not going to do and what it might not do? Reality check, you, whoever wants to talk can talk. You're muted, uh, your uh, laughter is muted, Eric. Yeah, I'm watching Eric laugh and thinking, yeah, who wants to, wants to go for that? I, I'll, I'll take it. I, okay. I really do think that um, 
you know, it, it, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of telling that the universe was, was trying to do something by um, this sort of transition in leadership happened and then the pandemic happened and then, you know, the, the social uprising happened. I, I sort of look at that all as a kind of flow um, in, in, in the world and the impact of that flow. Um, I think it's going to be incumbent upon um, leaders of not only our, our time, but, um, but you know, leaders of color, um, leaders of the global majority to, uh, to really be at the forefront of, of making sure that the impact of last year's social uprising actually takes hold within our industry. Because here's the, the deal is that, you know, if theater doesn't, doesn't come back or if it doesn't make it, you know, if it, if it comes back next year, but doesn't actually make it, you know, for an additional five years, it will be because we have told a generation or two or three that they are not welcome. We have told people in all kinds of bodies from all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of experiences that this is not for them. And then we continue to proliferate these ideas and stories that allow for, um, that support and substantiate the kind of racial violence that we are we are witnessing and that we have been witnessing for generations but even more recently you know the the the, the beating up of an, a 65 year old um asian woman in front of a store you know that, that, that we are actually a part of of what substantiates those kinds of acts because we are unwilling to shift the way that we that we do our works, tell our stories, support artists, um, engage in in real discussion about reflective about change. That and and so what we're telling what we're signaling to the generations to, to come behind us is that we don't really care. And so we have to we actually have to embody. Um, the change of this movement. Do I believe that my colleagues are thinking about this? My white colleagues are actually thinking about this, not in the way that they should be. You know, I, I haven't, I haven't had extended conversation. Everybody wanted to talk about this. You know, when George Floyd was was murdered last year, but you know, over the course of several months, people have started to back up and they're looking at me like, I wish you would stop talking about that, as if stopping stopping the conversation stops the action. And they're just going to wait for the next big social uprising to take place. Um, but I know it's incumbent upon the people on this call and, and other leaders of color that we're going to, you know, I, I actually can't, I can't be in an industry that's not going to shift. So I actually have to do the work to shift it in order for me to survive in it. So even if it's just for self-preservation, but, but what makes it worse for me is, is, is knowing that we are, what we're setting up is for another generation and another generation after that, and another generation after that to experience the same kind of violent acts and harm that we continue to perpetuate as, as an industry. So I have to do something to shift that. Okay. You know, that's, that is my mandate. I wanna kind of make that concrete because you know violence is a big word. Uh, and Eric, I'm gonna look to you. Would you say, I mean, would you say that as a theater, you have, uh, uh, you're complicit in any way with anti-Asian violence that's going on right now? Um, I mean, insofar as we are complicit in white supremacy, yeah, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, listen, so what I think this is, I think, I think a little bit to answer this question, it's important to name, right, that, you know, we're not, I mean, we're not coming together to address a problem in the theater, we're coming together to address a problem in, in our society in our culture, right? And it's like, and it's like deep and embedded. It's like, you know, centuries old. And, and you know, and I think that it's hard for me, to, like, I think when we talk about spaces that where we're gathering and organizing around this change, do you know, it's like what, what becomes very clear as I'm sitting and I'm observing kind of people engaging in the conversation, it's very hard to let go of privilege and power. I mean, it's almost impossible to, do you know, there's like, there's something kind of primal um, and instinctual about wanting to hoard that thing that protects the people you love as a parent, right? It's very easy to say that. And it's also important to name that. And like, and then to hold the multiple truths, right? Of both wanting to be able to hold on to that thing that is gonna keep my daughter safe. And also simultaneously needing to center an idea of divestment. Like, how do we divest ourselves of, of like, like, so I'm, I'm Chinese American, right? So like, I think that it's an interesting moment to be kind of holding both the violence that's happening in our AAPI communities and the sort of like the violence that happened to George Floyd, that murder and like this trial and, and like, and to see these videos showing up 
right? Like I'm because I'm Chinese American, like I always like I also I always want to name that I'm sort of white adjacent. Like that's been my experience in life moving through the world is that as an artist of color, I'm often brought into organizations and I'm given privileges in part because I'm safe or I have been safe, you know, and a little bit part of where I am in my process right now is I can't be safe anymore, right? Like if I'm not causing the same kind of discomfort that I feel when I watch these videos and I'm like, oh, I'm like watching these videos and I'm recognizing how fragile and how vulnerable these kinds of coalitions are because that's, that's the centuries of, of systemic oppression that are kind of like, like working to tear us apart in like deep genetic, like no way that we are conscious of kind of ways. And so how do we like, so how do we as theater makers, it's not like, it's, it's not even how do we as theater makers, how do we as human beings, right? Approach our role in our communities as one of healing. And, and, and again, that's what I mean. I think when I say that theater is just simply a tool, it's a tool for this. It's not like, like if to, to center theater in this conversation feels also to me woefully inadequate. So Hannah, you and I were both in Baltimore uh, in the wake of, uh, of the death of Freddie Gray. Yeah. And um, I, let's just take this word of uh, Eric's healing and, and tell me what that means to you seeing this long line, you know, we go all the way back to Michael Brown and Trayvon, this long, long line, uh, which by the way, everybody, I, I wonder, given the fact that new, you know, the news plays it over and over again, uh, is this is is our reaction to it as a country that much different than you know lynchings where there were postcards and stuff mm -hmm. you know handed out? Uh, so this is why I think passive observance is so dangerous. Mm -hmm. But here you are in Baltimore, Maryland, downtown, and you know how do you weave what you tangibly, viscerally learned in that situation at center stage, and now with 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 us. In, in, in fact, in the front, in front of another uh, theater, which is the trial. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. When people ask me why I took the job in St. Louis, I often frame it that I chose St. Louis because St. Louis is very similar to Baltimore. And in Baltimore, I was cutting my teeth uh, behind my artistic director's name. So I got to, to, to try out some ideas without actually having to have uh, my name and my skin on the front lines around how art can be transformative to community. Kwame. And I was looking for a city that demographically, that socially, that culturally mirrored um, where I was already doing this work in this space and where I had been experimenting with ideas. And so St. Louis has been an incredible city to be in, not just because of the wake of, of Michael Brown, but you can go back to Dred Scott, right? And the role that, um, uh, race and the framing of race in that city has played for this nation. And so it's a profound space to be in, in the wake of all of this. Um, you know, when we talk about healing, you know, it was just in a conversation um, about lateral violence. And I think it is impossible to talk about how we actually dynamically change what is happening in our society, what is happening in our field without acknowledging, you know, Nataki will often, if you don't mind me quoting you, talk about the fact that racism is the water, not the shark, right? That we've all been raised, inundated in the system of white supremacy and carry pieces of it inside of us, no matter how radical your upbringing might have been. Um, you know, and so, and so if we're actually going to dynamically change what is happening in our industry and by the nature of that in the tool that we have as far as theater is concerned, our communities and by the nature of that communities then our societies, then we actually have to deal not just with the centering of whiteness and white supremacy, but we also have to talk about anti-blackness. We also have to talk about the divides that exist with whites so of the way we've embedded white supremacy and the way that we treat each other as BIPOC folks, right? And what I think, when I go back to your initial question about um, what this moment might, what might be possible and what might not happen, what might happen. What I will say is that 
fundamental change is going to depend, as Nataki said, on the BIPOC folks and where we decide to invest our energy and how we decide to use our collective power. What we know is that more than a year ago, everyone, including our veteran white AD contemporaries and colleagues were saying, we're never going back to where we were in January, 2020. And what I found in the last six months is that those veteran voices are trying not to say that anymore because there's been enough time and people have made enough statements and now everyone has an idea or an EDI committee and they're hoping that they've done just enough to push the question of how invested they are in um, equity off so that we can actually just double down into the status quo. So do I believe that this means fundamental change across the field? No, because everyone's not working towards that. In fact, the majority, I think, of the institutional machines are working to sustain the status quo as everything else in our society does, right? And so what is going to have to fundamentally change is how artists and artisans and administrators, particularly those of colors on whose back the work has been made on whose back the, the institutions and machines profit, we actually have to change. Right. And here, here, the one way to look at this too is, you know, an opportunity. The, the three of you all cut your teeth in uh, white environments. Um, and, you know, look, I'm, I'm thinking about Ellen Stewart. You know, I hope y'all aren't so young that y'all don't know who she was. So here she is down on the Lower East Side. And, you know, she's, you know, she's got Sam Shepard, she's got these Eastern Europeans, right? And, you know, cut to, I was interviewing Spike Lee one time, and I said, how do you get these fantastic performances? He said, well, you know, I just looked around and saw, I said, you made a lot of stars. He said, well, I just looked around and I saw all these people who weren't working. That's an opportunity. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, there's all this talent out here. And you all know what it's like not to work, not to be accepted, not to be honored, not to be taken seriously. So part of, to me, what you can do is take advantage of all this talent, all this, all that's walking around. But I also, you know, because we're going to open up for questions, you know, as I said, but, you know, I want to think about, you know, I just said, you know, many of you came, the three of you all had, you know, substantive time in white institutions, but you also came from your mamas and your daddies. And Hannah, I'm, I'm going to leave you to last because I don't know about you, but I'm going to quote something I came across from my man, Eric Ting. Quote, everything I know about running a theater, I learned from my mother, Ting says. She ran a Chinese restaurant in the middle of Appalachia in West Virginia. I always knew people came to see my mom. They came to see people they knew and had come to love. What you could count on was really good food, laughter, and good music, a welcome smile of recognition. And now, Nataki, I know that your father taught Angela Davis. So <laughs> why don't y'all each talk about that? And how to, you know, jump right on in about what it means to come out of these particular heritages that are very particular to y'all. Eric, let's start. Well, I, go ahead. Nataki, let's start with you. Okay, uh, so my, my dad actually gave Angela Davis her first job when she got out of jail. He started the San Francisco State Strike. And when you grow up with activists in your life, um, you learn two things. The first is that um, is that is that change is incremental, right? And that uh, how we were all raised by these revolutionaries, you know, some of whom were Dr. Barbara Christian at you know um, at UC Berkeley and Daphne Muse, who was at Mills College, and you know we summered at um, uh, at um, uh, in Boonville with with like in this colony of writers, you know, when we were kids and. And so that's, those are my roots. Like I was raised by these powerhouse, you know, mostly women who changed. Who feels a little bit like Oregon. Like, yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, that's really. It, it really is. It, it was a, when it was at, at Alice Walker's second home up there. 
Um, uh, so the thing that it sort of generates in you is the second thing is that is that you are the actor for the next level of change. And so your parents did something so that you could do something else so that you could leave a legacy of somebody else picking it up and doing more. So each time you do more and more and more and more and more. And, um, and being raised like that meant, meant that I never, like it's, it's like service is in there. Like you gotta, you get up out of bed and you do the things you represent the entire race. That was, I grew up in one of those houses. You know, I'm gonna be 50 this year. And when you're coming up on that milestone, you know, you, I like really start to look at the like half century that I've been here and all of the ways in which things have shifted and all of the ways in which I, like I'm looking at all the threads that I'm responsible for pulling forward. You know, my first professional world, um, life was, was I, I, I was privileged to be around Kenny Leon in his early years as a, as a leader, right? And, and then I, you know, and then I moved to New York City at the like, you know, just as 40 acres and a mule was coming, you know, like, I, so I have this like this, I'm watching these, these movements and thinking, I got to pull that thread, this thread, these threads, those threads, this thread, all of this stuff, and I'm, and I'm ready to do it. I have the, the strength in my body to do it. And I can see that I got to pull it, push it all past the horizon point. So that's what I'm in the process of doing. I pick up the mantle that my parents laid down for me. And I don't actually think about whether or not I have a choice. If I could do something else, I would. I wouldn't. This is who I am. This is how I was raised. And so here's the other thing about it is that I don't care if people see it in me or not. I'm still doing it right? Because I'm not doing it for titles and I'm not doing it for accolades or recognition. I'm doing it because it's embedded in me. I have to do it. If I do something else, usually I have a very difficult, terrible time. So I'm happiest when I'm in this workspace and when I'm actually moving things forward for other people. Eric, take, take me to Appalachia and that Chinese restaurant. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because I'm always so envious when I walk into spaces and there's time given to sort of name ancestors and legacies and to sort of like, to really talk about the sort of the deep generational kind of effort that um, has led us to a moment. And it's funny because I'm envious, right? Because, you know, my mom, my mother and father came to this country. And, um, and like one of the earliest memories that I have is my mother and father making the decision as I was starting kindergarten like I spoke, I, they spoke mostly to me in Cantonese at the time. And then like they made the decision in order to help me learn English to like cut Cantonese all together and just speak to me in English. And so there's like this period of trauma in my, my, my youth where I was like, I didn't understand the thing that my mother and father were saying to me, you know? And so I think that, um, and, then, and then growing up in Appalachia meant that there wasn't a lot of exposure to other people who looked like me. Um, and other people who had similar experiences to my parents' experience. And so, you know, for me, my experience has been largely about being unmoored um, from the kind of cultural legacy, um, from the ancestry uh, that I, I, I find so many of my friends having such deep strength in. And uh, so, so that, that, that passage that you shared, Anna, is sort of like, you know, for me, I think the thing that I learned from my mother is how to make family, right? So when, when you don't have that family built into your community, when you don't have that sense of history and that breadth of, 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 of just like the, the blood that connects us, um, you know, you're, you're, you're tasked, right? You're tasked with um, building the skills and the tools to, you know, to nurture um, a family that you make. And that's kind of what, I saw my mother do and what I have learned and to me what the practice of theater is. The practice of theater is about sort of like, like just sudden acts, sudden acts of creation around, around just a community, a, a, a family of people. Well, I mean, I love this word welcome. I use it all the time, radical welcome, radical hospitality. And I think it's connected to humility and I think it's connected to healing uh, because the wounded healer, of course, is the one who can really uh, welcome others. Hannah, tell me about you. So I'm, I'm a fourth generation activist and um, raised in Texas. Um, I, I, I say it's a combination of fourth generation activist, the talented 10th and black nationalism is what raised me. Um, my great grandfather was the first black postman in Beaumont, Texas. 
Um, he had 10 children, all 10 of them. The story is that all 10 of them uh, went to undergrad, nine of them retrie- received graduate degrees and they all worked to set the next one to school. So they worked in a button factory to save money to send each one to school. Undergrad, all of the men with the exception of one became doctors, all of the women became PhDs and educators. My parents um, were black nationalists uh, before I was born and then transitioned into Sunni Islam. Um, but uh, so I was raised with the concept of servant leadership being uh, in the DNA, that there is no separation between the service and the work that you do on behalf of the culture and the people and how you identify yourself as a human being, right? So my grandfather in, integrated the you know, public university system in Texas their children, they pulled them out of school and integrated the private school uh, secondary education system in Texas. My parents sent me to a private Muslim school for the first three years or four years of my education and then moved us into a neighborhood where we were the only black children, the only Muslims, put me in a school where my siblings were, we were one of 10 and said, and now you must navigate the world. You have to understand who you are and why you are and what you come from. And then you must navigate this world because this is the world that you have to succeed in. And so I would say that I am grateful every day for that grounding, for that rooting, for understanding that I am because they were and that there is, I don't ever walk with the simple sense of individuality. It is always the duality of the collective and the individual together. And the power of resistance I'm hearing in these stories, the power of resistance or uh, Eric, again, to quote you, uh, the notion of uh, leaving assumptions behind, but the power of resistance to restore dignity um, to our communities and to our art form. Pato, a bear, do we have any questions? We do, and I want to encourage everyone on the call to to drop them into the Q&A, but I'll start with a big one. You all have assembled an audience with some good, tough questions. Rick Westerkamp is asking, as we look toward theater coming back, how can arts managers and artists combat what Ibram X. Kendi refers to as the conjoined twins, capitalism and racism? Tough question when you all are squaring your budgets, right? Building audience, trying to keep the house open in a pandemic. Huge question from Rick. I can start. Well, I'm going to start us off. How about that? Like, because I this is this is not a question that can be answered in 15 minutes. Um, but I think, and I, I'm also just noting a, a question a little bit further down, which has to do with um, uh, how do we change a system from within the system, and should we be changing a system from within the system? And I think that um, I would, you know, from from we've been having a lot of conversations about this at Cal Shakespeare. We're a Shakespeare theater, right? So it's like. So like, as far as theaters go, it doesn't, it, it's like, you can't get further away from anti-racist than a Shakespeare theater. Like, it's like, you know, Shakespeare's in the name. And so it's sort of like, so, you know, so it's not really about whether or not we, we are an anti-racist organization. I think that as long as Shakespeare is in our name, we'll never fully be that, right? And I think that like part of our practice is about understanding that and naming that and knowing that and acknowledging that and then being accountable to it, right? And so like, so I think that's the same thing when we talk about how capitalism and, and racism and anti-blackness appears in our sort of in, in our practices and in the way that we work, right? Is that like, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, I would say yes, absolutely. I've considered on many occasions, maybe just the other day, like getting out of the system and trying to change it from outside of it. But like, I, here's the thing about it, right? It's like capitalism is the system. Like we're not like, if you are in this country, you're in the system. So like on some level, right? Like, like you know, you, everyone is operating from within the system to try and change it if you're here. And like, and I think that to me is like a thing that I hold a lot, right? Which is, you know, um, this notion that like, we have to be able to live in multiple truths. We have to be able to hold the fact that we are both part of the system and contributors to the system and complicit to the system, but also resistors to it. Um, And to me, it's like, and to me, like the big part of that is just about being able to name it and being willing to like speak those words out into the world um, and not be afraid of how people are going to respond when they hear you say them. I mean, this, this, uh, this combo, um, 
this uh, trio could take us home on that very question. Should we take us another question, Pato? Sure, it's a little bit of love that has a cousin question. So the love is coming from Richard Colton says, you are all so beautiful. I want to see the spaces you build from ground. And then goes on to ask, do you ever consider not changing the theater system from within white built structures or does one need to be in the belly of the beast? And you hinted at that, Eric. Hannah, you spoke to it, I think, earlier in your choice to go to St. Louis. But I wonder if any of you want to take up that question of where we choose to do our work and how that informs what each of you are doing. I actually believe that it's, uh, I think you, I think some of us will do it from within the belly of the, the beast and some of us will do it without. I'm, I'm, I'm a product of um, uh, the, the Berkeley Black Rep. You know, I, I, all the church plays that I was in, I went to a black church. Uh, grew up in the one of those. I, I feel like um, I, I, I have embedded in me and I am a, a product of um, the culturally specific theater, um, theaters that, that helped raise me, the dan Dimensions Dance in, in, in the Bay Area. Like these are the way, this is, this is what actually gave me, gave me life um, and, and told me that I not only could do this work, but should do this work. And every single time I have had the ambition to move a little bit further ahead in the game, those are the people who are like, no, no, go for that. You better go get that job at, at, at uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So, so if you're working within the belly of the beast, I, 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 I for, for me, as work, somebody who's working within the belly of the beast and have, I've had several years in, in that, um, uh, I bring with me all of the work that I did from, from without. Um, and the other day I was listening, I was, I was listening to a, a panel in which this idea came forward that like you're, your job when you're in this is to sort of uh, in your in your reparations for for having these these positions and opportunities and having this sort of positional powers that your job is to give it away. And I actually think it's deeper than that, because I think it's not about like, can you give how much stuff can you give away? I actually think at the, at the center of it is like, how can you center the thing that you're doing and actually give rise to that? Because if, if the operation is going to be capitalism, um, the, the sort of radical act is to continue to center the artist in that, is to sort of shield them as they begin to bring forward the thing that is you're, you're going to take advantage of uh, fiscally. Um, uh, and, and so what my radical act is going forward is really what does it mean to radically center the artist, to really give the kind of not just fin financial resources, time resource, space resource, headspace resource, bandwidth. How can I give you all of the things that I have? So that you can do the thing that, that you really need to do because because we need you to tell us where we are and what we're doing and how we're going to survive this um we we need you to to reflect back to us so so i think it's also like centering this idea of like what is it, how are you going to be radically being in the belly of the beast since the whole thing is the beast it is the water you know capitalism is the water um and it is tied into racism in, in the exact same way listen resources are no joke I mean, y'all should come clean about that. You have resources. And I don't even know, Nataki with the other panel we were on uh, with Jeremy and Kate, and, you know, it's like how ready is philanthropy to support individual artists? Because yeah. it's hard thing to say, come here, I will take care of you. Well, that's a little infantilizing. Yeah, well, so what it's, I- it's, How will we, sh you know, like, Resources are no joke. Y'all do have resources. And, and, and if, you know, I don't know, did you grow up, you grew up in Berkeley. Did you ever go to this place called the Rainbow Sign when you were a kid? No. It's like a community center. These are wonderful places, but let's talk about the reality of what it means to have resources and not. Healthcare and not. Equity is a disastrous union. So let's just, let's come clean a little bit about resources. Yeah, and, and just to sort of, just to sort of pull your point forward a little bit, it's uh, for me as an artist, because I'm first an artist, like I'm, I, um, I happen to have administrative um, um, uh, abilities, but I am very first an artist and having, having been in spaces where I was served and also not served and used and also not used, um, uh, what I'm trying to do is open up first thing is like, what do y'all, what do you want? How do you want to do it? And if you don't want me to be there, when you do it, just go ahead and do it. I'm trying to figure out a way not to give it away, which I also think is infantilizing, but to create a space in which people can come through and take what they need. How do I do something that's not a conveyor belt? 
how do I make something that's more like a food court where you can have that French fry and this ketchup and you can sort of choose, you know, from what you need. And I don't know if the individual um, uh, uh, donor is interested in doing that. Um, and, I, and I think when, I, when we say that, we sort of have a specific kind of individual donor in mind. But I know there are some individual donors out there who are interested in that. And there are all kinds of corporations and, and, and other kinds of businesses and other places that have resources. So if my individual donors don't want to come with me on the journey, that's cool because well, no, I, mean, I got other ways to do individual, it. Individual artists, individual right. artists. And, and you know, the reason I bring up that other panel is because individual artists are in big trouble right now, just on the pandemic level, right? Anna, I sensed you were going to jump in, and then Eric. Yeah, I, I think that this this question of resources is really important, and I've I've always had trouble with the way that our industry has framed resources and the doling out, and who gets to decide what piece you have and how you have access to it. What's true is that foundations tend to invest in the larger organizations, right? Because there's this mythology that they actually are fiscally responsible, which let me just tell you when you pull back the sheets, it's not true. Um, there's, this, <laughs> there's this mythology that the smaller organizations or the individual artists won't know how to handle their money. And so everything has to be filtered through the large organization. And so for someone who now has access to resources and the positional power, my job is to reframe that story. My job is if you want to give me the money, great, give me the money. And then I'm going to break all the rules that you thought went along with it. And, and part of that is also this idea that um, I'm not super invested in the title or the seat. I only care about the work. And for me, the work is embedded in the individual artist. The work is embedded in the people. And so the fact that I don't care about the title or the seat means that I'm going to do with it what I will until you take it from me. And so my thing is like, you know, I'm here to 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 break open all that I can for as long as I have this seat with no illusions that I'm going to be in it for 30 years because they don't let disruptors stay in positions with resources and power for that long. Um, and I'm not afraid of what it means to move on, right? So that gives me a little bit of freedom to say, let's rethink all of the rules and redefine what this can be and hope that what we plant gets planted deep enough that when I'm gone, some piece of it still lives in the DNA of the organization. And my invitation for individual artists is come, as, as Nataki said, come tell me, come show me, come build with me. Uh, let me be a container to hold whatever it is you are seeking to grow. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I really think like, I really think, I really think our organizations have failed our artists. I'm just going to say that. Like, I think that like, as, as far as this last year is concerned, the truth of it is, is that we failed our artists and that like, on some level, this is a consequence of, you know, decades and decades of sort of institutionalization of our theaters, right? Where, where artists have moved further and further away from the center of these organizations and they've become freelance, they've become itinerant, they've become temporary presences. Um, and, you know, they're project to project or all these other things. And like, and all of the, all of the fragility that came out of decades of that being kind of formed and exercised, right, sort of revealed itself this last year. And, you know, I think that, like, what I think, there's a few things that I think, right, like, I think, like, I think that, um, I think this notion of us trying to rebuild, like, I think question, the first question is like, should we be rebuilding? Like, where are we rebuilding to? And like, like, and like, let's resist this idea that we should rebuild to what we were before, because that's the first problem, right? The first problem is that we were sponges. We sucked up the resources. Like, you've got three leaders of color of PWIs in this space right now, right? So we're not the small theaters of color. We're not the independent artists that are out there kind of like trying to make ends meet. We're like, we're like, you know, we have those resources that you're talking about, Anna. So like, to the extent that, to the extent that we sort of like, like, like if you are actually committed to EDI work, if you're actually committed to being an anti-racist organization, if you're actually like doing that work, the natural end progression, right? Is an acknowledgement that most of our PWIs most of our culture, arts and culture organizations, right, exist solely because of accumulated wealth, 
right? Built upon original land theft and labor theft. Like that is it. That's the beginning and end of it. And so really the question becomes, how do we, how do we as organizations, as leaders, right? Lead us towards a space, like not of, like not of hoarding our resources. Because like, that's what happens. Like that's what happens when you, when you feel yourself, when you're losing blood, right? All the, everything just like clenches and tries to, you know, and like, like how do we let go of that need to keep alive a thing that so many of us actually really believe was broken? Like, what is the, what is the path to resurrection? What is the path to kind of like, like redemption? You know, I, that makes me think of something uh, Cory Booker told me. And I'm sure he would include you in this, Eric, if, if he were here, because he's so smart with words. Black people have to resurrect hope every day. And I just love that because people, you know, that's for the main thing we hear, right? You know, people come backstage and go, I mean, especially Eric, you know, like, is there any hope, right? But just this notion of it being an active, it's not like it's just, where's the hope in the play? It can't end like that. You have to give the audience some hope. But this idea of the actual action of resurrecting it every day. Pato, um, you know, you're a man of real words. And uh, I think you should take us home, um, you know, because you can assess from where you are what we've learned and uncovered and not resolved today. But uh, before I pass it to you to take us home, I just want to thank y'all. I'm just, I'm just so delighted by each and every one of you. You know, um, Hannah, uh, this is the first time I've spent any substance time with you. You know, poor Eric, I got on his nerves for six months or weeks or something like that. And Nataki, we've had a chance to talk a little bit with my dear, wonderful, got to give a shout out to Diane Yu, also a New York uh, University individual who's the chair of your board. Pato, take us home. Well, I think one of the things we've learned is that we need about six more hours with y'all, even though you've got busy schedules. And what happens when we come together in a space like this and are able to talk from a certain starting point and with a certain possibility together, right? We need more of these spaces. And I, the second thing I wanna say is that we have tons of interesting questions that we just didn't have time to get to. So I wanna signal that to our amazing audience who showed up. And I'll close, Anna, with a comment from the future because I think each of you in your own ways hearken to that. This is Jessica Arteaga. She says, I'm a political science major at Whittier College, which is one of the suburbs of Los Angeles for those who don't know. And I took a theater class, so a political major taking a theater class. I found that theater is not just for show and entertainment. It gives a broader understanding of what's going on in the world. I had to write a paper on Twilight, Los Angeles, and Anna moved me to see theater differently. She asks a question, but I think she's really giving us a provocation and a direction. She says, do you believe as I do that theater appreciation or intro to theater should be a class that all students should take in their education. And I just want to thank Jessica for that question and that reminder about what's possible, each of you for the work that you do every day, and Anna for making an old in these spaces over decades um, and pulling people forward as each of our amazing discussants shared tonight. Um, I hope we can do this again, maybe in person and maybe with the warmth of our bodies, you know, di making dynamic space together in and out of theater um, and in the world making that we do together. So thank you, everyone. Steady on. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.